Th this option's been available the whole time, just nobody took it. So I'm gonna give the talk from the middle of the stage. So the first thing I have to do is I have to take off my conference organizer hat, and I have to pick up my scientist hat. So this talk is promoting the longevity of curated scientific resources through open code, open data, and public infrastructure. And I need to change the slide. So I'd like everybody to close your eyes, and we're gonna do a little bit of a group meditation. So please, please close your eyes. And I want you to think of the people to your right and your left, and I want you to think about the, the resources they've built, the databases that they've sweat, they've put tears into, and how important all of these resources are to your work. And I want you now to imagine that all of them go away tomorrow. They've all shut down, they lost their funding, they're out of date, they're abandoned, they're inaccessible, oh no. How does this happen? Well, funding changes. People who are the important curators of the databases, they, they leave, they move on, they get better jobs, they finish their masters, their PhD, and they've got new things to do. And sometimes the priorities of your institute changes, and therefore the importance of your database is now a little bit more lower in the funding situation. How bad is this? So Guy mentioned uh, about 3,000, maybe 3,100 resources they were able to find. Um, a, a assessment that my group did was of all the resources that provide information about namespaces and semantic spaces, over 1,000 out of almost 1,400 of them in the bioregistry are gone. So this is an incredible number of databases. So this is maybe a third of the ones represented uh, based on what Guy was mentioning earlier today. And there's a couple caveats to where this number comes from, but the, the point is, a lot of resources just go away. How do we do better? We've been talking a lot about sustainability throughout this conference, especially this morning, and I wanna give sort of a concrete idea on how we can deal with the idea of sustainability and longevity, and we're gonna give you sort of a, a technical and a social way to think about. Now, we haven't come up with a name for this yet, so keep in mind we might be able to give this a better name by the end. So here is sort of the technical overview of the idea that I want to present. And it's a combination of using uh, the, the data, the code, and automation through public infrastructure, keeping them in a, a version control environment. And so this is a technical solution to sustainability. And then the social solution will be to keep the maintainers, the contributors, the stakeholders, and users all able to interact with this system. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna give you the seven easy steps to success. So if you want to be successful, you can use this as your guide. And to keep it a little bit concrete, I wanna show you how we did these seven steps in a resource that I've been working on a lot in the last couple of years called the Bioregistry. The idea of the Bioregistry, in short, is that it's a fully communi community curated uh, resource for uh, naming all the prefixes for semantic spaces that are useful. For example, in the connected data world, maybe think back to Jurvin's talk the other day, and this is a way to break down those barriers between isolated resources by having them use a common semantics and syntax for the way they talk about things, you know, concepts like genes or diseases. So the first step is to version control your code and data. And on the slide here, we've got a picture of GitHub. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with GitHub at this point. Um, if you are able to get all of the code that helps you maintain your database and all the data all in the same place in version control, it means that there's a public record of all the changes, and there's lots of great ways to keep track of what's going on here, which I'll come back to next. Once you've got all of your stuff in version control, you need to use really permissive licenses, both for the code and the data. And I think we've already heard from a couple people this uh, week about the success of using these kind of open data. So the first to highlight is Lynn uh, from the Disease Ontology, and she's used the CC0 license to make sure that the Disease Ontology can be easily reused by people. And in the context of sustainability, it means that other people can make modifications when they need to fork it, make changes, but we'll come back to that. And then, uh, also, we've got Tiago evangelizing Wikidata, and, you know, reusers gonna reuse. So, <laughs> you can use your permissive licenses and people will be able to work with your data even past the lifetime of the resource in case these failure modes happen that I mentioned in the beginning. The next is make your data approachable. The first thing is it possible to make, make things very complicated if you have your data in multiple different places at the same time and you have to update the data in different places. So I want the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Keep it in one place, the single source of truth. 
The second thing is to reuse external standards. So again, I'll, I'll mention we should use you know, prefixes for your data, for your queries and your URIs standardized by the bioregistry. But this also means use standard ontologies, controlled vocabularies, use standard formats. And specifically about the formats, keep your database in simple, uh, non-proprietary formats. Keep your data in JSON and TSV, stuff that you can see as it changes over time easily. What's the difference? Using very complicated proprietary formats or things like, uh, yeah, um, like the Stockholm format, maybe you're all familiar with this from like the nucleotide databases. Not easy to use, not easy to look at, not easy to work with. Don't make that burden on the maintainers of the database. So in the bioregistry, it's JSON all the way down. The whole database is just a JSON file. It gets maintained as a JSON file, both a combination of automated and manual approaches, which I'll come back to in a minute. But this means that anybody can just say, hey, the database is a file on GitHub that I can look at. There's no uh, internal infrastructure from an organization. There's no hidden SQL databases that have persistence problems. It's just a JSON file. All right, step four is a big step. This is automation. I've got four things on this slide. The first is to use automation to do quality control. And this has an incredible number of facets. But let's say the simplest version is if people are editing data in your JSON or TSV file, you want to have a continuous integration service that runs every time people make an edit and it says you put a typo here, you use the wrong schema here, you maybe need to use identifiers from this vocabulary here, and you use the wrong one. Take the burden away from your maintainers as much as possible with automation. Now, on the other side, it's not just the code that needs to be automated and, and quality controlled, but also, sorry, it's not just the data that needs this, but also the code. So this is not the conference about everybody getting the best coding practices, but if you want to make it easy for people to maintain the code that's attached to your database, which also this is the code that runs your quality control, you should quality control the code itself. Make sure you use standardized formatting, you use standardized uh, yeah, tools for checking that people document the code as they change it. Okay, the next thing is generate artifacts in an automated way. I mentioned the bioregistry is created as a JSON file, but there's a lot of different things that get created from that JSON file that people want to consume. There's CSOM files that map between bioregistry and other registries, like identifiers.org. There's prefix maps that can be reused by other semantic infrastructure, and all sorts of other files that get created by the source, but aren't the source itself. The next is to make sure you do versioning, releasing, and archiving in a completely automated way. Um, so when you make some changes, you want to make a new release. This is like saying my version goes from version number one to version number 1.1 or some other scheme like that. Use the tools that exist to take care of that for you. And when that version bump happens, make sure it gets released to something like Zenodo, which makes it permanent archive. It's a tool that's specifically for archiving your data forever. And then we don't have to worry about this data persistence anymore. Let's say the FTP server goes down. Has anyone had this problem? Maybe your data is on an HTTP um, website and people can't get to it anymore because they use Firefox. We don't want that. So archive your stuff. And then most data resources probably have a website associated with them. Maybe it's a website that shows off all the data inside it. If you can, build your website in an automated way from the data itself that can be done in the same sort of scenario and then deployed. So for example, the bioregistry is deployed both to PyPI as a Python package, to Docker Hub, uh, so people can pull it and run it as a web service, and then also it gets sent to Amazon Web Services to run on a very tiny little machine that costs $25 a year. So it's not bad. So the bioregistry also goes a little bit further. It does its updating and its maintenance with some automated scripts, and it's able to pull from all sorts of other registries, which includes the, the bio portal, um, the Obo Foundry, identifiers.org, other resources that are sort of in the same scope. This, this talk isn't meant to be about the bioregistry necessarily, but it's a good uh, example. Now, one other thing the bioregistry does really well that also contributes to maintenance is sometimes people aren't comfortable using GitHub. I think this is a problem that, that we mentioned in the careers and curation uh, workshop, and people will become more familiar with this over time. But in the meantime, Rather than making people edit JSON files, the bioregistry also uses the issue tracker system on GitHub to automate editing the database. So if you want to add a new prefix to the bioregistry that describes your new resource that you made, you can do it, you can fill out the issue, and then an automated system will make an update to the JSON file and will ping all of the reviewers. So then nobody has to write any code to make updates to the database. So GitHub's the platform, the open infrastructure. So on top of this that I just mentioned is to use social workflows to make, the pos make it possible to maintain your database, not just as your internal group, but as a community. 
And so we mentioned before, being able to have an issue tracker associated with your database where people can make suggestions, requests, and like I mentioned before, they can even do the, the maintenance of the database itself by creating issues. This is an important thing that every project should have. The next is some people will be so excited about your resource and making it better, they will come and they will make the edits to that JSON file themselves. And they'll give you a pull request, which means that the code on your database and the data in your database inside the version control repository, they get updated by somebody else, and that's a chance for you and your maintainers and your community to go ahead and have a discussion. Do we like these changes? Do we want to request improvements to them? Does this fit with our philosophy? And more generally, yeah, to have a discussion in an open and transparent way is super important. So I, I want to highlight Steve Marigold's poster, number 46. If that's still up, this is great. FlySyc, Go, and EC, they followed this workflow. FlySyc, need, uh, and, and this is part of Flybase, they needed to make some improvements to Go and EC to improve their data quality. So they went upstream, they made issues, they made pull requests, and they made improvements to the gene ontology and to the enzyme, uh, enzyme class information. So this is a great example. All right, some things you shouldn't do. Never, never work with private emails. I know a lot of us like using emails and it's comfortable, but this means that there's a completely private history of your project. It's making it hard for people to get on board with it. They don't understand the history. It's just not that good. Second, give credit early and give credit often. It costs nothing. There are tools like Apicuron to make a technical solution for it. You can give people some shout outs in your talks and it doesn't hurt to give credit. So if you want to make a problem, you, you don't give credit to people. And try and avoid, this one's not so easy, this is a high-minded idea, try and avoid discussion gridlock where people who have such opposed opinions that we can't make any movement forward. Maybe you've been in a community discussion like this before. Yes, I see a couple nods. <laughs> All right, six out of seven, and I got three minutes left. Establish an initial minimal project governance. The idea is we're not gonna know how the project's gonna evolve over time, and it's really difficult after the fact to start adding some rules. So having a code of conduct that tells people how to act in your community, you know, like be nice to each other. Having an authorship policy, especially a nice one that says everyone who contributes gets to be on the paper, easy. And make clear what the rules for onboarding and offboarding are. Who gets to be the admins? Who gets to make the final decision for pull requests? These kind of things should be in writing. Oboe Foundry does this really well, and all of these ideas I've borrowed from them and modified to my needs. And I want to give a hat tip to Melissa Handel, who really sort of mentored me in thinking about all this stuff. All right, last one is, it's not just about you and your group working on it, but how do we attract and engage the community to contribute to sustain your resource? There's a couple bits to this, and these aren't the fun parts, because they're not the flashy thing that show up in the grants, they're not the things that show up in the papers, but you need to write information for people on how to contribute, like where do I start, you know, do I, do I make an issue, do I email people, don't do that, do I make pull requests directly, many of you in this room have gotten pull requests from me, unsolicited, and it may have made you uncomfortable, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> make sure that your code is good, I already mentioned this before, it's not just about the data, but the whole infrastructure surrounding it, if people can't understand how your resource works, then maybe contributing to it's not going to be so easy either, and document what it does to teach people, train them, mentor them. This is also not an easy and not a fun part of our jobs, but if you want people to use your resource to be a community resource and then to be sustainable, you need other people who are gonna know how to use it in case you do move on. Maybe one day I give up the buyer registry and I cede it to the other people working on it. Yeah, so this is how it goes. Last thing and then we're done is find a neutral home. Resources that live inside your organization's top level uh, GitHub repository. You know, if, if the buyer registry were in the, the Harvard GitHub, it doesn't have the same community centricity as one that's in sort of its own. All right, last thoughts and we're done. Three things that don't work about my ideas. The first one is that it's really hard to, to think about the, the philosophy of this. Community projects are hard to, to claim. Um, if, if you really believe that your project's a community project, it's hard to say to your, your bosses, to your funding agencies, this is ours, we built this, it's part of our grant. So maybe you've got some ideas that we can share about this. It's also kind of this mis mismatch of incentives. People are incentivized to make new and shiny databases rather than contribute to the community in a lot of situations. And I see this, a couple people are thinking about this. Peter Karp brought this up two years ago at the BioCuration Conference online, and I think we're still talking about this. All right, the last two things. Um, how to fund these is an open question. So we're gonna continue this conversation that we started this morning. And uh, yeah, the, the GBCR is, is one possibility, for example. 
And the last thing is I mentioned about doing all your curation sort of in a version control repository. This doesn't work for every kind of database. The bioregistry has maybe two, 1,500, maybe 2,000 prefixes. Uh, this doesn't work for a nucleotide archive where there's billions and billions of records. So if you're on the scale of maybe less than 100,000 records in your database, this is the right fit for you. All right, so this is a lot of ideas. Uh, I want to acknowledge you know, my team and uh, for, for making it possible to sort of build this resource within the scope of some of our projects. So Ben's in the audience. He's given a talk before, and Quas specifically. And then the others who have worked on the bioregistry, too, to make this kind of a cool community resource. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much. I'll take some questions. Before we take the question, I think we should all uh, thank Charlie for the great work that he's done. And I think that you've seen with the energy he puts into a presentation, he puts the same energy in organizing things, and we've been driven with a good speed. With, not whip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the whip. So it was a great pleasure um, co-organizing the and being led by you. And give this back for questions in case people need it. And yes. These. So. Yeah, I can uh, start. So first of all, awesome talk, Charlie, and uh, very inspirational. I agree with every single thing you said, and I hope that uh, we all and uh, as a community will adopt some of these ideas into our practices. Can you sketch us a little bit uh, your kind of idea of what exactly happens when the person next to me gives up her project? Like, what would be the transition? Of a, uh, of a resource that what was curated by someone into a more kind of community environment, and how would that work? How do you see that working? Did you tell me the answer to this question before? So I think a good example of this is the Protege project. Um, so anyone who's curating ontologies is using this as a tool. Um, and this was sort of abandoned maybe some years ago, or not abandoned, but the funding ran out and the, the incentives moved on from the group that was maintaining it. And maybe it was a year ago, six months ago, that, that they sort of decided to move it out of the institutional organization into a neutral one and uh, appoint some new people as the admins who are interested in making contributions. And so this project actually started back up. I'm not sure what it did in terms of its governance and its uh, contribution policies, but it seems like this was an example of, of something that actually was brought back. So it's, I, I like to think it's sort of the same idea for a purely code-driven project. Where, so Protege is like a, a desktop application versus a database, which is also something that's version controlled. Yeah, thanks, thanks for a really inspiring presentation. And there are lots, lots of things to agree with here. Um, I, think, I think, though, I'd like to ask you about legacy systems. Because I think uh, outside the, so you, so you sort of made a disclaimer about big databases. But, but you mentioned Stockholm format. Um, mm, for, yeah. I, I think that's alignment format, isn't it? Um, but but there, so there are, I think, databases that are really important and really useful. But they're quite old, but they're not big. Um, and so they're using older formats. They probably pre-exist GitHub and, 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 and lots of the things that you, you print. So what, what, should we try to transition things? What's the balance between you know, investing to, to transition to this system versus doing other things, maybe increased curation or, or better training materials, the other options that are available? Yeah, you're right. A lot of databases we've talked about focusing on the technical infrastructure when what people need in the community is the curation. So, so this isn't an easy thing to decide. And uh, yeah, there's only a couple instances of, of tools that are starting to do this curation this way. I mean, I think everybody's probably read a paper that, that talked about a database and they were able to maybe scrounge up an Excel sheet that represented the database. Um, so I, I don't know if I have a good answer for this one. The big databases uh, doing this inversion controls is almost like a technological limitation. So you're not going to transition the ENA into using this sort of system. So th there's going to have to be other solutions for, for bigger databases. Maybe this will inspire some of those solutions. If you've got ideas on this, uh, anyone in the audience, yeah, I think we should talk about it and, and start writing these things down so maybe people can try it in the future. Well. I, I give one you. last I note before I go off. Yeah. So, so if anybody wants to try this, get in touch with me, and I'll support you. If you need mentoring on how to program this stuff, how to, how to use one of these tools, because if I'm being honest, the seven easy steps wasn't really seven easy steps. It was more like 50 hard steps. 
that, that go across uh, you know, eight different domains that most people aren't trained in all of these. So if you want help with some of this, please get in touch with me. Thank you, everybody.